Hello there, everyone. It's four o'clock sharp. We're coming to you live from San Diego, uh, New Jersey, New York, Hesperia, California, that's near Mammoth, um, Los Angeles, California, um, Seattle, and maybe one other place. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm sure there's going to be more attendees coming on slowly, but um, let me start by making some introductions. and show you who our faculty is so let me turn that up and share my screen with you sorry <laughs> here we go sorry okay so today we have Dr. Erwin Goldstein, one of my colleagues uh, on campus at Alvarado Hospital. He's the director of the sexual medicine program and a clinical professor uh, at UCSD. I'm sure everyone knows who he is. Uh, our colleague, Dr. Barry Komizarak, he's the distinguished professor of psychology and neuroscience at Rutgers University. And uh, um, Barry and Erwin and I kind of meet every week and we go over cases and we um, try to decide what we can do to tell patients. Uh, I'm Chol Kim. I'm one of the spine surgeons in San Diego. And then we have a very, very special guest, Dr. Andrew Goldstein. He is uh, the director of the Centers for Vulvovaginal Disorders. He has offices, I believe, in Washington, D.C. and New York. So, and he's the past president of Ishwish. And he's, you'll see that he's one of the, uh, um, one of the smarter guys in the room. Uh, and we are really lucky to have him. Um, in addition, we also have April Patterson, who is a pelvic floor physical therapist and a specialist in sexual medicine. She's from Los Angeles, California. We also have Linda Cataldo, who is a patient advocate, and she's the co-founder of the PGD Facebook support group. She also happens to be a patient. Um, April, you said it was okay, right? Yes, that's fine. And mm -hmm. April turns out to be one of our patients, and I think she, if we have a chance, she can tell us how she got into all this. And I think mm -hmm. part of it is because of her own experience. We also have a very special guest, um, um, KS, which they want to remain anonymous, and her daughter, uh, who is a Tarloff cis patient. Fortunately, apparently there's some kind of blackout in Philadelphia somewhere, so they may or may not be joining us. So uh, if they can get onto the internet and, and uh, get online, then we'll hear from them and we can ask them questions too. So today's format really is about questions and answers. We don't want to give a bunch of lectures. And to kind of make all that happen, the person that is our rock, the person that brings everything together is Sue Goldstein. She gets her own slide with her own picture, and she also has the best picture. Uh, she happens to be married to Erwin Goldstein, but she's all of our kind of uh, like overseer and don't take this wrong. She's kind of our mom because we're just a bunch of children in a, in a sandbox sometimes and we need to be grounded. Uh, she's also the clinical research manager at the San Diego uh, Sexual Medicine uh, Institute and um, the managing editor of Sexual Medicine Reviews and a certified sexual educator. She's gonna keep everything together um, and help with uh, directing this because this is a very unstructured event. We had our event about, I don't know, a month ago and it was an hour of lectures and we asked our attendees if uh, they had any suggestions and almost everyone said, it was great, but can you leave more time for questions? And I think we're gonna try a format where it's mostly question and answer. We have slides that'll help us answer the questions because a lot of the questions are very common. Um, but uh, what I would like to do is hand over um, the mic to Sue, who will just kind of tell us in perspective what's going on and also introduce Dr. Andrew Goldstein. Dr. Goldstein will give us a case presentation to get us started, kind of put everything in context, but I encourage uh, everyone to please um, use the chat box to answer questions um, because really this should be about a Q&A of the experts and we'll try to really dig deep and answer specific questions. So with that, Sue. 
Thank you, Dr. Kim. I think you've got the most important points across. We really do want this to be interactive today. So for those who have patients, people who are listening who are actually patients, not only can you ask questions, but if you feel you have a response that you would like to share for a question being asked by somebody else, please feel free to write that in the chat box as well. Um, we will be monitoring that throughout. But to sort of get things started, we do want to start with a case with Dr. Goldstein. Um, I met Andrew Goldstein many years ago. People assume he's related to us. There's no relation. I do have a son named Andrew, but not this, not this Dr. Goldstein. Um, but we're all tied together because of the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health, which is working right now on a huge project on uh, genital disease pelvic dysesthesia. Um, Dr. Andrew Goldstein is a past president. Dr. Erwin Goldstein is a past president. I'm president-elect. Um, April is a member. Dr. Kim is a member. Linda is a member. So this is, it's nice to know that we are not just a bunch of cowboys. Oh, Dr. Karmasar, okay. paper picture wasn't there. Dr. Karmasar is, is a member. We aren't just a bunch of cowboys trying to come up with something new. We're actually trying to help the world to make a better place for those of you suffering with genital dysesthesia. And with that, I would truly like to, to introduce to you my very dear friend, Andrew Goldstein, who has the passion and the knowledge that will bring to you today some tears to your eyes if you've not heard this before, and he's going to present with it for us a case. Andrew, take it away. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Um, thanks, Sue. Thanks, Joel. Um, what I'd like to do is just to get the ball rolling, talk about just one possible um, case of a woman who has... Uh, PGAD, GPD, and, um, and one potential cause. So Julie, which is not her real name, was, but was actually an entertainment director on a cruise ship. As you guys may remember, Julie McCoy was the cruise director on the television show, The Love Boat, hence uh -huh. that title. That's her name. <laughs> She actually quit that job about three years ago when she got married to a man that she actually met on one of her cruises. So it really was a love boat for her. She had a baby about four months ago. It was a vaginal delivery that she reports there was nothing unusual about the delivery um, other than she pushed for four hours um, and they helped the baby out with a vacuum, uh, which is not uncommon. She was very happy that she didn't have a C-section um, because she was told that she had a very narrow pelvis and that her baby had a very big head, um, just like her father, which was her husband. Next slide, please. About six weeks after her delivery, she reported that she woke up twice in one week having orgasms in her sleep. This had never happened before. She had had, had sex dreams before, but she had never actually had an orgasm in her sleep. So she found that very strange. Um, about two weeks later, she started to have a sensation of almost constant arousal that was even worse when she was breastfeeding. Um, and she would have orgasms while breastfeeding. She felt so ashamed that she was having sexual pleasure from breastfeeding, and she worried that maybe she's some kind of sick person, or what she said, a, a pervert. Um, and she was too, because of this, she was just too embarrassed to tell anyone. She just was so upset about this, especially because it was associated with breastfeeding. It was just, it was, just, it was terribly upsetting to her. About uh, another four weeks later, however, her sensations of constant arousal started to become painful like um, something was sticking into my clitoris or sticking my clitoris into an electrical socket. Um, but she found that uh, just by trial and error that she didn't have as much pain when she was lying down. So she spent much of her time in bed, which made her feel like a lazy fool, which again, even um, compounded her feelings of guilt about having, these, about having these sensations, these feelings that she had. And now the only way she could get better is if she lay down. So she just felt terrible about herself um, uh, and that was terrible um, as a new mother. She then started to go from doctor to doctor to doctor until she found, uh, she finally came to my office. Um, and I did a physical exam. And I wonder if any of the other experts want to jump in and maybe figure out what, uh, what, what I may have found on my physical exam. Anyone want to chime in? Any guesses? Dr. Goldstein? I think Irwin that's a perfect one for Irwin. <laughs> My brother from another mother. Can we go to a slide? Yes. Yes. So I think um, it's slide twelve, but I could be wrong. Hang on, Andrew. That's a very interesting uh, patient, by the way. Um, slide twelve. Okay. No, no, not slide twelve. Go to slide. Keep going up, 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 up more. 
more and more up. Or the other way around. It's like 15, 16. Down, down. Or down. Okay, stop there. Stop at 16. Okay. So perfect. I hope you can see this. Um, and what it says is there is sort of, uh, am I, if you can't control. I don't control, so no, you can't see my, like, my pointer. No. So you'll see in the white rectangle, uh, you'll see the word end organ. Can you see that? Um, you're on Cotty Quina. Go to the left. Dr. Dr. Kim to right the left. Right yeah. End organ. So we call that region one. Go to the next one, pelvis perineum. So that's the connection between the end organ and the spinal parts. Go to the next one. The Cotty Quina lift is called the lower part of the spine. And go to the next one, the spinal cord, we'll call the upper part of the spine. Then all of that information is translated into the brain. So, if you so count, basically what you're saying is yeah. we're looking at it from an anatomic standpoint, going from the brain or going from the end organ section by section. And that's how you're starting to think about the diagnosis and what you're looking, trying to figure out what's going on. Is that fair to that, say? That would be correct. So uh, when Dr. Andrew Goldstein saw this patient, uh, among other things, he should examine the end organ. He should examine the connection between the end organ and the spine called the pelvis and perineum and then uh, uh, get studies like MRIs for the, the spine part, um, and then uh, if it's appropriate to get uh, counseling or, or other issues associated with the brain. So it's just a, a logical strategy to take any patient with GPD, genitopelvic dysesthesia, or for that matter, per persistent genital arousal disorder, and it doesn't necessarily mean that a person with PGAD or GPD has to have just one single reason. It could have a series of reasons, and it makes it a little more uh, uh, interesting or, or as a detective to figure this out. But uh, if you start with region one, which is the end organ, so you can put your pointer on end organ, one of okay. the classic things would be to examine it, typically under uh, um, a magnified uh, view to, called vulvoscopy. And if touching it, it's very tender, to then put some local anesthesia medicine on it and see if the tenderness goes away and the genital pelvic dysesthesia goes away, the electric shock sensation to the clitoris. If that went away with numbing the clitoris, then that would make sense that that would be derived from there. But if you numb the clitoris and she still had the electric shock feeling, then it would be something that we call upstream. Upstream from the end organ would be either the pelvis perineum Equina, spinal cord, and brain. So why doesn't Andrew tell us sort of what he did? But this is an organized way to think of an evaluation. Um, thanks, Erwin, and I completely agree. So when we did an exam, um, there was nothing visually abnormal about her clitoris, um, her the vestibule, which is the entrance of the vagina, or her urethra, um, and so uh, and uh, numbing the the clitoris and, and the vestibule did absolutely nothing. Um, however, when I put my uh, did an exam with my finger in her vagina, she had an exquisitely tender pelvic floor musculature. The, the muscles that surround the vagina and the rectum and the bladder were very tender, but more so on one side. In fact, it was almost uh, all on her left side. And especially when I put, um, uh, pressed on an area called the ischial spine, and that's uh, what we call the sits bones. And right next to that ischial spine is a nerve. It's called the pudendal nerve. Um, and the pudendal nerve um, comes out of the sacrum at the uh, sacral levels two, three, and four. Um, and that nerve um, goes through what is, no, what is called Alcox Canal. And Alcox Canal is an area right next to the sits bone or the ischial spine. And um, it can get injured. It can get injured right at that spot. One of the classic ways it can get injured is actually during childbirth. Um, and the longer the baby's head is pressing right at that spot, the more likely it is that an injury can occur. And as we found from Julie's history, she had been pushing for, for uh, four hours, so that baby's head was pressing right at that nerve for that long period of time. In addition, she was told she had a narrow pelvis, which means that she had very prominent ischial spine, 
which means they were just they were pointing more inward. So the the space for the baby's head to come out was even smaller than usual. And of course, the baby's head was large, just like her husband's. So that combination of pushing for a very long time, in addition, um, uh, her normal anatomy, which was, which was pretty narrow in the baby's head, that combination of three things caused that nerve to be injured at that area, causing her um, initially PGAD symptoms, but those symptoms started to go away from arousal and more towards pain. And what's interesting also about her story is that nerve, um, if you're lying down, that nerve has more room to, to move and it's not being as pressed as when you're sitting. And so her symptoms were much better when she was lying down. I also think it's interesting that um, initially her symptoms were while she was breastfeeding because that sends other signals up to the brain that sort of allow orgasm to happen. And so she initially, um, that's why breastfeeding um, made it worse. And I think Dr. Kamasar could actually explain that a little better than I can. But um, uh, clearly uh, this was her problem. She had a, what is called pudendal neuralgia pudendal nerve injury from childbirth. And the way I confirmed that is I did a pudendal nerve block where I injected a numbing medicine right at that spine right there, which numbed the nerve completely and her symptoms miraculously went away. I think, uh, that's, a, I think that's a really good point that I just wanna um, kind of uh, expand on. Um, I'm new to all this since I'm the spine surgeon in the group, but it, it, it strikes me that there's multiple ways that you can get PGAD, GPD, and all these types of uh, symptoms. And it's vital that we identify where in the anatomic part of our bodies uh, these symptoms are coming from. So we rely in part on, on making a hypothesis that it may be coming from the pudental nerve, and then you block the pudental nerve and see if your symptoms go away. You do a VAT, which is a, a test of the local uh, vaginal and genital area. And if that helps, then it's coming from the local area or region one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Absolutely. So, so, so that's why yeah, we can, go ahead. I'm sorry. This is a question from the audience that relates to all of this. Um, she asks, why did my rectal pain go away with a prudential injection if the issue is in my spine? Can I answer? Can I, can Dr. I address Dr. that? Dr. I'd like you to answer that, please. Can I answer that? Could I see slide number 24? Slide 24? Yeah. Um, this is, uh, if you see the, this is the, the pelvic nerve, which is related to the pudendal nerve, very close, they're both uh, very close to each other. The pelvic nerve carries sensation from the uh, vagina and the uh, bladder and the rectum, and it goes into the spinal cord. And if you see on the lower on the lower right that rectangle, there's a, a herniated disc, a, a bulging intervertebral disc that presses on the fibers on the nerve fibers. You can see it projecting into the what that area called the DRG. That's the that's the that's the nerve itself going into the spinal cord. And so the irritation. So the the uh, there's actually damage to the nerves in the, in the spine, in the spinal canal, but it's referred to the vagina or the other organ. So, so with, with a, a damage to the nerve, it's, it's referred to the, sor the actual source because normally when there's stimulation of the, of the uh, vagina or the rectum or the bladder, uh, it stimulates that nerve. If you stimulate the nerve directly in an abnormal place, like where it goes into the spine, then it's the the uh, it feels as if it's coming from the uh, the vagina or the rectum or the bladder, but it's really the problem is caused at the uh, direct stimulation of the nerve. It's like if you hit your elbow and you feel stars in your in your hand, uh, or if it's because you, you've stimulated the nerve and the feeling is as if it's coming from the, the, uh, the peripheral organ where, where it normally comes from. So it's just so, a, it's a referred pain. And one comment, I, I want to add a comment about 
what uh, Dr. Andrew Goldstein said about the uh, orgasm during breastfeeding, uh, what we found is that the, when we look at the brain uh, where the genital sensory input goes to the sensory uh, cortex, the, what we found is that nipple stimulation activates the very same area of the uh, brain, of the sensory cortex, that the genitals project to. And it's so the, um, and since the genitals can produce an orgasm, when you stimulate the, when, when you stimulate the, the breast or the nipples, it goes to the very same neurons. It's, it stimulates the same neurons that respond to genital stimulation. And that's how you can get the convergence uh, where, where nipple stimulation could produce an orgasm, particularly if, it's a, if, if the system is already sensitized, it's already irritated. Uh, that was clear. She was having um, uh, 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 feelings, uh, abnormal, abnormally intense feelings um, yep. from the nerve stimulation, and it was just sensitizing that area that responded to the uh, nipple stimulation uh, more intensely than normal and produced orgasms. So, I mean, the way I'm kind of looking at this is that um, uh, it's like a network of wires that are crisscrossing with each other, and depending on how everything is wired, uh, you can get all kinds of cross signaling. And I think that's probably why a lot of the symptoms are variable and can occur or can be perceived in different locations in the body. Is that fair to say? Yep. But let me answer or answer her questions. Well, Barry brought up the a very uh, uh, ex uh, exciting uh, discussion of the 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 basically it's sciatica that involves the rectum in in that case. But she asked the question. If it's in her spine, why did a pudendal nerve block block her pain? And I think the answer to her question is the pudendal nerve, if the pudendal nerve block really did block her pain, then there is some aspect to her pain that's being involved with pudendal nerve stimulation. It and not the it, spine. So yeah, well, that's a really a good combination. point. It could be a combination. Or a combination. So you can have pudendal neuralgia of sorts, and have a totally normal spine. Like for example, Andrew's patient who during childbirth was pushing and pushing and was probably had an epidural in place, could have hurt a, a pre-existing annual uh, uh, mm. disc that turned into a hernia that turned into an annular tear that could be a combined with the pedental nerve and the annular tear. We've seen, uh, and, uh, and you as a spine surgeon have seen uh, many times I'm sure, childbirth, uh, it, uh, 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 resulting in spine disease. We have a, question. We have a really good question. It's stimulating the nerve. It's basically stimulating the nerve fiber at the uh, at the ischial spine uh, before it gets into the uh, spinal canal. It's just stim if the it, there's an irritation of the of the nerve itself, and uh, that activity, which normally comes from the uh, clitoris now it's being stimulated uh, abnormally from the nerve directly, just like if you hit your elbow and you feel tingling in your hand. It's stimulating the, uh, the nerve that normally carries sensation from the clitoris, but it's happening, the irritation is happening um, at the Alcox Canal um, and numbing it blocks the sensation. So that's, I think that's the, um, it's a clear, a clear case. But pudental neuralgia now. all by itself probably doesn't refer to the rectum. Is that fair to say? Right. No. It's more downstream. No, it doesn't it refer to the rectum. Clitor if it does, pudental, okay. it would be clitoral. But could it also refer to the rectal area because of crosstalk? Or is it too distal? Well, the anus. No, there's, there's, a, there's a branch of the pudental nerve that goes, um, um, it's the perianal nerve, perianal branch of the, of the pudental nerve that actually can yeah. cause um, um, uh, rectal or perineal pain. So, um, in fact, a, a true pudendal neuralgia will give you typically um, at least hypersensitivity if it's really the entire pudendal nerve will actually affect from clitoris all the way down to anus. Um, yeah. And from uh, so, this was a, um, a first of all, I have to say that I have an incredibly smart um, co panelist here because they knew exactly what was going on. 
and um, it's it's nice to know that that we do have treatments for this, um, and I think that that's uh, number one. First of all, I also so we have treatments for the for pudendal neuralgia, um, and she got better actually with just uh, physical therapy and a couple of pudendal nerve blocks, and she's completely fine. I also think that this case points out one other very important aspect of this, which is the guilt and the the shame people feel when they have PGAD. Um, it would, this was, this is not uncommon. Um, it's, it's embarrassing. Um, it, it's devastating. Um, and, um, I think all of us as, as panelists want to emphasize to everyone who's signed in that this is not a per, this is not a personality defect. This is not a psychological problem. You did not cause this. You are, you, are, you are not responsible for these sensations. And we want to, if we had a magic wand, we would immediately just wipe away all guilt, shame, and embarrassment about this condition. Thank you, that's very important. We have a question for April. Dr. Goldstein, you just mentioned the importance of pelvic floor physical therapy. We have a question asking how pelvic floor physical therapy can help PJD. April, can you address that and perhaps you bring in a little of your own experience? Yes, um, if you can show my slide, and I'm not sure what number it is because I have us it's in full okay. screen. Um, the, the one that you've already been to, that one, please, thank you. Um, so the, the previous one, the start, okay. Um, so if your pelvic floor muscles are overactive, which means that they hold more tension and they don't relax as easily, they can cause um, potentially irritation and along the nerves of the pelvis, um, compression as well. And that can, those nerves, um, their function is for sexual function. It can also lead to other dysesthesias in the pelvis. So um, I just have just some examples. So you can actually just see where the muscles are and where the nerves are. And it kind of makes sense that if the muscles were too tense, that those nerves can be affected. Um, this was more to explain urinary urgency and frequency. Um, yes, we can go over here. Those are my three slides. Well, you can yes. just see <laughs> how, much, how complicated the musculature is. Yes. And then you take into account the spider web of nerves that are going into the pelvis. It's mm -hmm. a really nerve rich environment. I'm a spine surgeon um, <laughs> and I don't even know all the nerves. So that's why this is such an interesting, complicated field because when you have a leg problem from sciatica, that's just, it's like a dumb thing. It's a single motor neuron mostly, you know, somatosensory nerve, um, where when it comes to sexual function and all the pelvic organs, it's autonomic, it's, it's, it's much more complex uh, and there's a lot of interplay. So that's why we have so many panelists on, on the team. And that's why this is the only group of people that I have to meet with every week outside my area of specialty because I, it's, it would be impossible for somebody mm -hmm. like me to do this on their own. So we have a and million unbelievably awesome questions. So can I just make a, a comment? Sure. One, we have a set of survey questions that we would like to um, send out just so that our attendees can kind of answer some of the questions that we have. Uh, so at some point I'm gonna interrupt you and now may be a good time. And then there's at least three questions that we should get to, but um, can we do one of the, can we do question number one of the perfect? So let's just take a moment. Can you just give us a sense of what, uh, what your answer is and we'll be able to get immediate feedback because you know, this is 2020. You can't wait much more than about 15 seconds to get an answer about something. Dr. Kim, I think we should read it out loud in case there's someone who doesn't have, is only listening. So the question oh, okay. is, I have genopelvic dysesthesia, hypersensitive clitoris, numbness, and painful orgasm, but have had new symptoms for the last two years, pain with bladder filling, urinary urgency, no UTI, no yeast infection. My GP suspects I have interstitial cystitis on top of GPD. But could these symptoms be related to the Tarlov cysts at S2 to S4 instead? Huh. Okay, yeah, I think we're doing two different things. I wanted people to answer this question, uh, this survey question. I apologize. It's okay. And then we're going to, let's get to that question because that's one of the, like these crazy great questions that 
we'll probably be talking for days on end. Okay, yeah, so we have people asking questions and we have people asking questions in the chat. So we're going to do our best to get to everything, but please know we will yep. not be able to get to all your questions, but we're all of our providers are always available. So don't get frustrated. So let's okay, just go so over the this. Question oh, is, a Tarlov cyst could no, affect the that, bladder? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, no, he wants this one here. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> we'll get to that in a second. This is the survey question. Not that many people answered. There's only there's like a bunch of attendees, but only seven, 10 people. I bet while they're answered. answering, Linda Cataldo could address on average in the support group how many provide how many providers and how what frustration happens to people trying to find a provider. I'm I'm guessing that Linda can address that for us. Yes, and, and unfortunately, that's a great idea. Sometimes it also depends on the state you're in. Um, if you're in Utah, you're going to have a lot more trouble finding a doctor than you are if you're in California. Um, mo most patients go to between six and eight doctors before they find someone, and I think that's a low estimate. And the problem is the doctors don't know it. And when when we find when these patients finally come to us, we send them research material and. Uh, they go into their doctors with research material and the doctors are very angry that the patients have been doing research on their own. But it's, um, it's, it's How can very we make it difficult. easier for patients that um, need to find somebody to kind of start the process, well, this, but this, they don't know where to go because their, their primary care doctor is not really receptive. Th this presentation is fabulous um, to have information like this. This is something I will give to new members that I interview for the PGAD support group. And uh, knowledge is power. And when the process of care comes out, there will be no problems or very few problems with having the medical information that's there that's necessary so that patients can be started on a step-by-step -step exploration to discover what their issue is. And there are so many issues. I can't think of two people in our PGAD support group who have the same exact presentation of PGAD. It's very confusing. So you have a Facebook support group. That's one thing, right? Yes. Is there a society or, or, or a resource that people can go to just on a website and start reading about it? Uh, well, there's all kind of information on websites, but the problem with those websites is that um, people come to us and they'll say, well, am I going to have this for the rest of my life? Some people have had this since they've been infants. Um, one member in our group remembers at two years old masturbating on her baby bottle and her parents ignored her and didn't believe her. And so, um, I just lost my, my train of thought. <laughs> well, I think the issue is, is it's clear. Is, it's, it affects everybody and yes. um, most local doctors aren't aware of it. I personally yes. was not aware of this and I may have never been aware of it had I not been on the same campus as Irwin. And it took him six years to convince me to start looking at this. So there is a very big obstacle in terms of physicians um, knowing about this entity. So this one is one thing, of the reasons why we're trying to get the word out and then there's a we whole society in our PGED support group is an extensive resource in our Dropbox. One of those things is a folder of healthcare providers who are knowledgeable all over the world. And, uh, uh, could you type cool. into the chat box to all the attendees, how they would, could get to your support group. And then let's get to this one question that we were talking about, because this is a good one. So did you want to read that question again to everybody? Sure. I have genital pelvic dysesthesia, hypersensitive clitoris, numbness, and painful orgasm, but I've had new symptoms for the last two weeks, pain with bladder filling, urinary urgency, no urinary tract infection, and no yeast infection. My physician suspects I have interstitial cystitis on top of the genital pelvic dysesthesia, but could these symptoms all be related to the Tarloff cysts at S2 to S4 instead? Well, the answer is yes, and I think the person who invented this or hypothesize this and publish it, Dr. Kamazarek should probably talk about it. Uh, well, yeah, uh, the Tarloff cyst um, is, uh, it can be uh, uh, located on uh, affecting both the uh, 
pudendal and the pelvic nerves. Uh, if you, can you go back to uh, figure 21? Um, the, the uh, you, yeah, you see the uh, on the the bottom is the the pelvic nerve and the pudendal nerve, and the uh, if the uh, the the pudendal nerve carries sensation from the clitoris, and the pelvic nerve carries sensation from the bladder, um, and you see they converge near the spinal cord, and if the tarlow of cyst is where they converge, the tarlow of cyst is a is a, like a blister on the nerve and it uh it it it, it uh presses on the nerve just like uh, in the case of uh, what, what the, dr andrew andrew goldstein was talking about with with uh, uh pressure in the in the alcox canal the tarlow cyst can put pressure on the two nerves and uh, uh by by uh putting the pressure there it feels like it's coming from the clitoris and from the bladder, uh, but it's really, uh, it, it's, it's just referred to there because that's the normal pathway, but now you're, you're directly stimulating the nerve um, at the uh, place where they converge. Uh, so that that's was, good. that's one possibility of, of uh, the, the, uh, the tarlow cyst. It may not be only the tarlow cyst, it could also possibly be a problem uh, of, a, uh, of, of an annular tear or herniated disc uh, uh, was there any, did you have any kind of traumatic experience uh, before the symptoms started? They're going to probably have to answer on the chat, but I just noticed something. If you look at this um, diagram, what's interesting is that the pelvic nerve and the pudental nerve that comes down lower down in the spine, they have connections not to the bladder, but to the urethra the tip of the urethra and the vagina, uh, obviously. So I want to ask some Andrew or Irwin, um, because the patients that we talk to, they talk about like a weird sensation as they urinate or a buzzing sensation. It's not like they have necessarily a UTI, but as soon as you mention the urine, everyone just thinks it's a bladder infection. But is it that tight that it's not actually in the bladder that uh, if you have a pudental neuralgia or a region three in the spine, that you'd be more um, symptomatic in the urethra rather than the bladder? So one of the things you can know is differentiate, there are actually a couple of things you can do to differentiate between urethra and bladder, um, uh, and even the, what we call the vestibule. One of the things I think, uh, Dr. Kim, that you can help differentiate is it is almost impossible to have an interstitial cystitis if there are not symptoms not um, exacerbated by um, dietary uh, 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 challenges. For example, alcohol or caffeine or citrus. It's a, I don't think I've ever seen an I, a true interstitial cystitis patient that did not have some food or liquid challenges. So if you don't have those challenges, it's very unlikely that it is um, a bladder origin. Um, another uh, trick to do is people say it burns when I urinate. And it's difficult sometimes to know if that's burning for, um, from the bladder, the urethra, or the opening of the vagina called the vestibule. One of the tricks people can do is actually urinate in a tub of water. Um, if they urinate in a tub of water and the burning goes, they don't have burning, that means really what they're experiencing is burning when the urine touches the outside, the, the vestibule. Mm -hmm. So that's another way you can determine the difference. And also during physical exam, um, a good clinician can very gently, gently um, press on the bladder as well as the whole length of the urethra to fi figure out exactly where the pain begins. And often it's just really the last quarter of an inch um, of the urethra. Okay, we have a question. Uh, one, one last response. Andrew did a oh, beautiful please. response. Uh, Andrew and I have had conversations at 5.30 in the morning uh, working on this process of care paper that Linda brought up. And one day that will be in the public domain and will be very helpful. But Andrew brought up this very interesting uh, concept of taking some anesthesia and introducing it into the inside of the urethra uh, to essentially numb the urethra as we just talked about doing a pudendal block, as we talked about doing a clitoris block, as we talked about doing a vestibule block. This would be yet another location for the block. 
And if the urethra was essentially numbed by this lidocaine uh, material uh, and the person voided and the person still had dysuria, then we could say that it really wasn't coming from the urethra. It's coming from like a Tarlov cyst or something in a different location. Okay, I have something. One of our patients, one of Dr. Andrew Goldstein's patients, who's in San Diego for a workup, she, who has a Tarlov cyst and PGAD and urinary symptoms, is willing to come on live um, and tell us what her symptoms are like and what happened after a diagnostic anesthetic injection to determine whether or not the Tarlov cyst is contributing to her symptoms. So can you, can you guys see who I'm talking to right here? and bring her up as a panelist? Because I just want to point out one really important thing, because I think people, it's really easy, because I get confused, that you can have multiple causes of what seems to be the same disorder, um, because it's such a complex disorder. So it's so critical that we identify what's causing it. So sometimes it's multiple things, and sometimes it's either a Tarlov cyst or an annular tear or pudental neuralgia or something uh, local. And, and we spend a lot of time trying to identify where things are coming from. So I see a lot of questions like, how can I have uh, these symptoms without a Tarlov cyst but I have an annular tear? Or how can I have the opposite situation? And the answer is because multiple things can cause the same sort of symptoms and we do diagnostic injections. And we have Sam, who's one of our patients from New York. Hello. Dr. Gold, Andrew Goldstein's patients. So she came uh, and saw Dr. Um, Erwin Goldstein and then me. You can see how complicated this is. And underwent a battery of different tests. And by the time they got to me, my job was easy. They said, <laughs> we can't think of anything, but there's this Tarlov cyst. Could it be the Tarlov cyst, Joel? And so I said, maybe we should do a diagnostic injection. So... Sam just had that on Tuesday. So Sam, can you tell us like, uh, what were your symptoms, all your symptoms, but uh, since we're talking about urinary dysfunction, yes. like what you noticed, and then you had the injection, and tell us what you noticed afterwards during the anesthetic phase. Okay, well, can you hear me? Yep, very yes. well, thank you. Okay. And Sam, hello. Hi. <laughs> nice to see you. Thank you for Hi. coming on. My thank you, first of all, to Andrew Goldstein, then Erwin Goldstein, and Cho Kim. Because for 15 years, I thought I had a bad chronic UTI, and I took um, mm -hmm. a lots of antibiotics, thinking it was my urinary, I had a urinary tract infection. And it just, it was worse after sex. And then I felt like I had a scraping in my right clitoris. And I, and no, no doctor could tell me what it was, no urologist, no gynecologist, no dermatologist. Finally, I got frustrated and I wanted to see a vulva specialist and it led me to Andrew Goldstein. And so yesterday I had my diagnostic shot um, to see if it is the Tarlov cyst that's giving me the symptoms. And it, as, I was having a lot of pain on my left foot and all throughout my left leg a bad shooting pain and, and the left foot had been, I was hurting for a long time. And the right side of my, I, I felt pressure on the bladder and, um, and like, a, like if it was urinary related. And when I got the uh, injection an hour later, those symptoms did subside. So that's why, um, they, you guys know that it was related to my Tarlov cyst. I have, uh, on my S2, S3 uh, on the left, I have one and a small one on the right. Do you so, mind if I pull up that image? Yeah, sure, go ahead. This is amazing that I can just... We have an audience member who wants to know how big the Tarlef cysts are and where they oh, are. Oh, I'm gonna show you right now then. <laughs> okay. Because we've got permission. So this is like, you know, live. We also had somebody else, Dr. Kim, who wanted to know if you only can operate on a large Tarlov cyst or on small ones, can you do multiple ones at the same That's time? That's a good so question too. Maybe you can talk about it. Um, okay, so this is Sam's. And see that little circle right there? Can you guys see that? Yeah, I'm getting there. So 
So that yellow line is a cross-reference. And the image on the right is like a bologna slice, and the image on the left is uh, like a frontal slice. You can see the sacrum right here. Here's the pelvic bone. You can see her disc, which is pretty normal. And look at this big thing. It's obvious. It's not huge. And if you take the cross section, it's absolutely clear it's a Tarlov cyst. Now, here's the funny thing. I was trained that that does not cause any symptoms. And I talked to Sam about this. That makes no sense because when that cyst gets big enough and it starts eroding into the bone and we decide, okay, we'll now operate on it. You know what the most common symptom is? Urinary incontinence. So we're like, it doesn't cause anything, but when it gets huge, you become incontinent and will now operate. So it just begs the question, if it's not big, couldn't it also be causing urinary symptoms when it's smaller? And because of this whole kind of interstitial cystitis, I'm guessing, and the relationship with sexual disorders, I think people just kind of get really confused and we never realize that you can have a subclinical kind of urinary symptom short of incontinence that just makes you want to pee a lot or it burns or it buzzes or it's irritable. So um, the sure, question of whether or not it's too big or too small is not as important as is it too late or too early. <laughs> Joel, do, you have a, do you have uh, a screenshot of the Tarlov cyst from the previous one, you, 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 from your video, just a screenshot of the cyst? Or can you describe the surgery in terms of, uh, some people believe, someone told me that he had heard it was a 10-hour surgery for the Tarlov cyst. Can you just give us a very nutshell overview of that? Yes. So like everything, the length and complexity of any surgery, even though it's in the same anatomic region, is totally dependent on the magnitude of the problem and the deformity and the problems that you have to treat. So what's good about this one is that if you can see here, it's not eroding into the bone. But if you look on, you know, when you look in textbooks and in the peer-reviewed literature on series, and they're usually small series of patients that uh, undergo Tarloff cyst surgery, these cysts are huge. They're eroding into the bone. So if you look here on this one, for example, this thing may go all the way into the bone. So by the time you take the cyst down and make it look more normal, there's a huge cavity of emptiness that you have to do something with. So if you have to do a full reconstruction of the sacrum together with fixing the Tarlov cyst, it can take many hours. It can also take many hours if the Tarlov cyst is such that all the nerves have now kind of been split apart. So imagine like, um, like a mozzarella stick, when you peel it longitudinally, you get all these long fibers. If those fibers are just plastered to the side of the, cyst, of the dural tube, because the cyst has been splitting them apart and plastering them to the side, it's really hard to find a place to enter, to even open it up to get the cyst down. And then when you go to repair and close it down, you have to release all these little nerves off the wall without injuring them. And these nerves would be like the, thin, uh, the thinness of a hair. So if I had to do that, it would be like, I have a huge wad of gum stuck in this really dense shag carpet. And you say, how long is it gonna be able to, you're gonna be able to mm -hmm. take that gum out without injuring the shag carpet? Sometimes it'll take 10 hours. So we shouldn't be waiting that long. As soon as we know that, you know, a Tarlov cyst, whether it be huge or small, if we can be confident that that is the cause of your symptoms, it's better to go after it when it's relatively small. So this one, no promises though, Sam, will be really easy to fix compared to a, a large one that is both eroding the bone and going deep into the pelvis. This will be kind of like a chip shot in golf. Well, I'm um, glad you caught it on time. <laughs> right. Well, thank Dr. Andrew Goldstein. Thank you, um, Dr. Andrew Goldstein and Irwin. So I don't know if that answers your question about... Um, the size, but uh, it's really not about the size. The size affects the, the magnitude and risk of the treatment, but really we're just focusing on whether or not it causes, causes symptoms because it is really important to point out, my guess is, is that most Tarlov cysts do not cause symptoms. Let me say that one more time. Most Tarlov cysts do not cause symptoms. Only some of them cause symptoms. But if you just say all of them don't cause symptoms, you get in a situation like Sam's where she's been suffering with 
these weird symptoms and we think that tarlopsis is too small to do anything um, because we see many patients with tarlopsis like this just in the process of taking care of patients and we notice they don't compare, they don't complain of any of the disorders that we're talking about. Part of it could be that we don't ask. Um, I think that's a big problem by the way, but um, it's really about uh, identifying the cause because not every pudental neuralgia, not every disc herniation, not every annular tear, not every tolerance cyst cause symptoms, but some do. And we got to find out which ones do. And that's what we rely so on the target. Tar we have base. a question. What does minimally invasive surgery mean? And if you do minimally invasive surgery for a Tarlov cyst, how many days does the person have to be in the hospital? That's a really good question. And I don't want to just keep talking the whole time, but um, and minimally then invasive surgery is a set April. of surgeries that, um, uh, that utilize the concepts of trying to um, minimize what we call the collateral damage of surgery. So I'll give you an example. Typically, and I'm trained as a traditional open surgeon. I may operate on something, we call that the surgical target site, that may be like this big. But to get to that surgical target site, we may make an incision that is three times bigger because we need to see everything around it to know where we're going. You don't have to do that in the modern age because we have advanced imaging and image guidance. So if before you make the incision, you know exactly where the target is relative to the skin, you can make a bullseye, and you can make the perfect skin incision, and then make a perfect approach. Add to that, instead of using these powerful, gnarly, kind of typical retractors that uh, have really sharp teeth and that really crunch on everything to open everything up, you use more tubular systems, and then you use specialized instruments so that you can work around a tube. And I'll give you an example. If you use a pencil down a tube and you want to see what you're doing, your knuckle's in the way. But if it's bayoneted and your hands are away, now all of a sudden you can look around your knuckles. It's that simple. And then you're also gentle, um, et cetera. So Tarlov cyst surgery doesn't have like a, like a real dramatic mental invasive strategy. But the way I make this mental invasive is I use computer navigation. So I have a three-dimensional map of the, of the whole sacrum before I even make the incision. It's like cheating sort of like I'm driving in my car and I look at the road, I see all the cars, but I also have my little screen that tells me, okay, I'm kind of heading in the right direction and, and things like that. And then you use all the specialized retractors and then all the specialized instruments and you're gentle. So when I do it like that, most of my patients go home either the same day or the very next morning. And I, and I wish our patient that um, was supposed to be our guest who recently had Tarlov cyst surgery wasn't in the middle of a blackout and they may come on at some point um, she went home the same day, she started walking the very next day to test out her symptoms, and then she flew back to Pennsylvania? Oh. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's an option. On post-op day two or three. Um, so I don't know if that gives you an idea if it's middle invasive or not, but you're not going to be bed bound. You're not going to be in the hospital for days. Uh, and the other advantages of making the surgery middle invasive is that it turns out the infection rate is lower because the bigger injury that you have, the more likely it is that you're going to get an infection because there's more dead space and the tissues are traumatized, et cetera. So um, you know, trying to do things using mental invasive principles and everything that you do is really important, I think. But that's just my take For on it. For patients who undergo this surgery, can they go to any physical therapist or is there, or April, is there some special limitations or special thoughts about pelvic floor physical therapy? I think somebody who is a pelvic floor physical therapist would be ideal, but also that they have a strong orthopedic background. Because um, most people haven't seen a post-op Tarlov cyst surgery, but if they have really good idea about the mechanics of the sacrum and the spine and how to work with patients who have had nerve pain, pain, I mean, from nerves, but also um, that just have a good understanding of how to treat someone who has lower extremity pain, any type of radicular type symptoms, whether they're in the legs or the pelvis, um, how to assess for neural tension. And it's really individualized, the physical therapy, but someone who has um, great experience and manual skills as well, you, you wouldn't want to go to someone who is just fresh out of school, um, who doesn't have an orthopedic background, because pelvic physical therapists sometimes just stay in the pelvis. So having both, they should check everywhere. They should look at 
your trunk, your spine, your hips. Um, and so someone who has understanding of the whole body and how it fits together is who you want to see. And there's actually really great resources to find providers, maybe not someone who's seen Tarla of Cis, but there's a, a website called pelvicguru.com that um, I look for physical therapists for some of your post-op patients and they have bios on there and you can email the provider directly and they have patient resources as well. And you can just put in keywords like PGAD or um, spine, or if there's a degree like OCS, orthopedic clinical specialist, or someone have a specialized physical therapy degree, you can put that all in and help uh, weed them out. Any more questions? That's great, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I'm looking, we have so many questions. We have so many questions. I just want to try Can to we do a survey then? <laughs> Yes. All right. Can we do survey number um, three? So this is a survey for our attendees to get a sense of kind of what's going on out there. So um, if you guys can see that on the screen, just take some time to answer. And you can choose as many as you want. This, this, is, an ex this is our effort to try to see how many different types of symptoms occur at the same time in patients. Okay. Um, can I ask you a question, Erwin, while we wait for the answers? Please. And Andrew, sure. how important do you think it is to uh, have pelvic floor PT um, either before surgery or after surgery, you know, just as a treatment? I think Andrew already said that pudental neuralgia can be treated well with PT. Um, like, how does all that work? Like, why would pelvic floor PT help pudental neuralgia? So what I, what I find, um, uh, uh, Dr. Kim, is that um, when it's sort of difficult sometimes to figure out which came first, the chicken or the egg, which is that an injured pudendal nerve will cause the muscles of the pelvic floor to tighten up as a guarding mechanism. Alternatively, sometimes tight pelvic floor muscles compress on the pudendal nerve and cause pudendal nerve irritation, maybe not a true pudendal neuralgia. Mm -hmm. So often what we will do is we'll have patients first try to um, pelvic floor phys physical therapy to try to normalize um, the tone of the pelvic floor. And if the, the, the pelvic floor tone is, is much better, but the pain is not better, then we know that it was the nerve causing the pelvic floor dysfunction. Another way we can actually try to piece out this, and good physical therapists also do this, is we'll do exams not just through the vagina pressing on the nerve, but in fact, we'll do an exam through the rectum pressing on the nerve. And that actually is pressing on less, pressing on the nerve through less muscle. So we try to piece together whether it's the nerve causing the muscle dysfunction or the muscle causing the nerve dysfunction. Um, but just like our first patient, we actually treated both at the same time. We treated the pelvic floor dysfunction as well as we treated the pedonal neuropathy with nerve blocks that included anesthetic and a steroid to get rid of the inflammation of the nerve. Mm -hmm. And then Erwin and Gary. Perry, yeah, I'm sorry. Just one small point. Another role of physical therapy is post-op uh, to, to provide knowledge of physical activity constraints and what is appropriate and what is inappropriate. We had a woman where we said it's okay to do just general activity, and she viewed general activity because she wanted to lose weight because of the COVID virus and all this sort of stuff. She walked seven miles. And then the next day, her post-op symptoms became very bad. So I think, um, I think it's really important for individuals who have surgery to understand uh, what is good and what is bad. And I think April, because she does most of, of that, uh, is really helpful in, in, in providing constraints, uh, not, not to be completely bedridden, but to have constraints in- I think the world is guidelines. Guidelines, there you go. Thank we're, you. we're kind of running out of time. Um, we're supposed to be done in one minute, but mm -hmm. I'm happy to stay on longer. But I want to, I want to look at this. This. Um, can you put up the results of the sh uh, poll? So two things. One, it is amazing how many people have urinary symptoms mm -hmm. together with sexual symptoms. We're urologists. Then, we see this a lot. <laughs> I, but I'm really surprised. Um, so we need to start looking at that more. 
I should probably start asking just my spine patients too. And then two, um, there's a lot of depression and anxiety. So, um, and I don't think it's the kind of depression and anxiety where, oh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm miserable and I'm symptomatic and I'm having a hard time. I think there's, it, there's like one level more um, of involvement. So I know Barry knows a lot about this, but can you guys talk about this, this kind of relationship between sexual dysfunction and the brain? Because I think there's like a more direct effect on depression, anxiety, and things like that, because it just seems like the suicidal ideation incident seems way higher in sexual medicine patients compared to my spine patients who are also very debilitated physically and they're in pain and many of them are taking narcotics. So, um, but I've noticed the distinct difference between the two patient populations. Can you kind of talk about that possible link? Sure. Barry going to talk about the, the uh, projections that the messages are coming from. Uh, that go to various regions of the brain because we've had a lot of conversations about this. Barry, are you there? A particular um, patient of, of yours, or uh, Dr. Goldstein, that uh, um, a, a woman who, had, uh, who has uh, uh, back, buttock, and leg pain, and also clitoral pain. And uh, when, as soon as she gets a clitoral symptoms or any genital symptom, she suddenly feels depressed and suicidal. And uh, it, she said, it's not even, uh, I spoke with her, she said, it's not even a, a, a feeling of, uh, it's not even a bad feeling. It's just a feeling of kind of um, matter of fact, it's time for suicide. And it's, but it only happens when she gets the, the genital symptom and not when she gets the, the uh, buttock or leg or back pain symptoms. So it sounds like there's something unique about the genital stimulation. I mean, this is, you know, it's just very new and it's very high, very, very speculative, but it's possible that there's some kind of inhibitory process. And we know that genital stimulation produces strong inhibition uh, because it blocks pain. Genital stimu vaginal stimulation blocks pain. So there's a, some kind of unique inhibitory effect, and it also produces uh, the uh, post-orgasmic refractory period in men. There's, so something about genital stimulation activates some kind of strong inhibition, and that may be related to the, the feeling of uh, depression. Uh, Linda but, wants to talk now. Very speculative. Yeah. Um, the, I don't know any pig ed patient in our group who is not anxious. And uh, it's hard to decide whether the anxiety came before the PGAD or the old chicken and egg thing. And it's critical, critical to get a handle on anxiety. Um, personally, I teach my intake patients a breathing technique called um, alternate nostril breathing. And that helps downregulate the nervous systems and you can't think about anything if you're trying to figure out which finger to put on your nose. And getting hold of anxiety through yoga breathing and also through things like body stroking, something that's gonna down-regulate your nerves uh, is helpful. Some people we've been dealing with have been able to get past the PGAD or calm their symptoms down 80% just through relaxation techniques meditation, yoga breathing, it's a well, parcel of the thing. I and hear you guys talking about how it's really speculative, but if you just think about sexual activity, um, no other activity brings, upon, brings, brings out these intense emotions right. and feelings of, of ecstasy and, and happiness or whatever compared to all other activities. So there must be a tight link somewhere. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's uh, some anatomic basis where there's nearby nerves and nearby regions. Um, and just looking at the homunculus, things like uh, where the brain maps your either motor or sensory function to the genitals right next to the nipples and the toes and the feet. Um, so and the bladder and the anus and the rectum. Yeah, yeah. I suspect yeah. there's yeah. probably... Yeah. 
I can tell you that it, a lot of it has to do with the loss of control. You have absolutely no power over when symptoms hit and what they are going to do to you. People can go for three months with no symptoms and, and out of the blue, PGAD will come back. With, when I was having um, physical therapy for my issue, I would have a three month period of no symptoms and then something would happen, an event in my life that was upsetting and I would go back to square one and have to start all over again with PT. Anxiety is the bear and it's so important to learn. I want to say one thing about Linda. When Linda was in our office in the waiting room, and Sue will talk about this if she wants, Linda's dog died and yeah. that was a huge flare I can't to go back to PG. It was unbelievable. But I think the most interesting thing was that at the time, Linda, you didn't recognize that these your 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 family, you had an aunt that passed away. You didn't recognize that the stressful things occurring in your life were causing the flares. Oh, and absolutely. For those outside, it was clearly obvious. And now that you know mm -hmm. that, you can help other people in the support oh, yes. recognize that. So even though uh, therapy, whether it be physical therapy or psychological therapy, may not stop the pathology that's causing the PJD, it can, those things can help you deal with the stress and calm yeah. your body down. And so it's really important to recognize that there are other therapies that may not be curative, but can help at least control until you can, you know, get somewhere where someone can help you. Absolutely. It is, a, it is a team approach where your physical therapist needs to be talking to your mm -hmm. sexual medicine doctor. If you have a psychologist or psychiatrist involved, they need to be in on it. And it has to be a team approach or it's not going to work. All right, you guys, we're unfortunately out of time, but I know we can just keep on going forever. So we'll have more of these. Um, and um, we have so many questions. How can, um, there, if people need to follow there? up with questions that are unanswered, what can, would be the best way to kind of close the loop? Can they write the questions to us and we can look at them and, and try to answer them? I think Seattle Science Foundation can do something like that. Alexis or Linda, remind me. Yeah, Dr. Kim. So uh, I think what we'll do is we'll save all the uh, questions that were submitted and we'll send them over to your office after the fact and then um, we can just follow up that way. And remember that you can go to Dr. Kim's website, Dr. Goldstein's website, Dr. Goldstein's website, and we also have a Center of Excellence for General Pelvis, Pelvic Dysesthesia website called spine-sexmed.org so that you can get more information about this combined program that we have. And um, that's a good idea. And you can also come to PGAD support. Right. Okay, I have an we idea. Posted, we posted that to all the panelists. Alexis, I mean, can we send a email to all the attendees with like a thank you and then a list of resources that each of us want to put in there so oh. that everyone gets like okay if i wanted to uh find out more about volvidini i'll go to volvidini.com if i want to find out more about the pgd support group go to this we can do that right yeah yeah definitely we have everyone's uh contact information that participated in the meeting so yep we'd be more than happy to um, help get that email out. Um, you can just send over the contact information and then um, to include in that email and um, we'll definitely um, get the follow-up questions, a copy of the recorded presentation, and then a, um, a link to um, whatever uh, additional resources you'd like. That sounds wonderful. I think what's exciting is last time we did it, we had somebody on from Australia. This time we have somebody from Japan. <laughs> Hello, Japan. How, how can we respond to the, to the questions? Individually, we can respond afterwards. They would just reach out to you directly through either your email or a website or something like that. I right. don't mind. So, so when we send out, the, we'll send, when um, Alexa sends out the information with all of our websites, the person can choose to write to mm -hmm. each, each or every one of the panelists based on mm -hmm. what their question is, and then we can respond. OK, good. Terrific. Well, we'd like well, to thank everybody for signing on today. Thank you, everybody, thank for you. signing on today. <laughs> Look forward to thank seeing you, you all Kim again later. And to our special guest, Dr. Andrew Goldstein.
thank you very much. Dr. Dr. Karmasarik is on the East Coast, like Dr. Goldstein, but he's part of our West Coast group. Um, so it's a pleasure to have a guest, and next time we'll see if we have a different guest, or we'll see what the new, next topic is, but please watch for announcements for future programming. And special thanks to Sam, and let's all wish her the best of luck. Yes. <laughs> Good luck, next Sam. Week. Thank you, guys. <laughs> yes. Take best care. Wishes. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Bye.